Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tony Robinson with MAP, and welcome to today's webinar titled Hydraulic Specific and Cavity Pressures. What's the difference and why do they matter? Presented by Jason Robinson of RJG. Just a few notes before we get started. We will be keeping all attendees muted throughout the presentation. We are recording the webinar and it will be up on our webinar archives page in the next few days. You will need a member login to access that page, so just reach out to us if you need any help with that. There is time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the question or chat features on the GoToWebinar pop-up to ask any questions. Also, if you have any logistical issues, you can use those same features and I will help you troubleshoot. With all of that being said, I will turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Tony. I uh, appreciate everyone who's uh, logged in right now. And um, so uh, nice to be here. This is the first webinar I've done for MAP. So um, let's get right to it. So hydraulic specific and cavity pressures, um, and what's the difference and why do they matter? So um, for those of you who have um, all electric machines, sorry, all hydraulic machines or a mixture of electric and hydraulic machines, this will be very important to you. Um, even if you have all electric machines, there's, there's something to learn here. So, um, and like, I'm, I'm going to pretend like I'm teaching a class. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So here's the scenario. And, um, so I've been doing molding. I've been with RGT for 11 years. Um, I worked in for 17 years before that in a plant environment. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are I'm, I'm telling them myself, um, I've, I've lived the, these experiences I'm talking about. So. Um, there's a machine A, we could call it whatever brand of machine you want, it really doesn't matter. So it's a 150 ton machine and um, let's just say we're running a, a product in there and the product's making, the, the machine and mold is making good parts, we, we like how they are. So I just put up two process parameters up there. So there's many more, but we're just going to work with two for simplicity. So the back pressure is at 50 PSI and the hold pressure is at 1,000 PSI. And to be more specific, um, it is set at 50 PSI hydraulic for the back pressure and 1,000 PSI hydraulic for the hold pressure. So just like happens in most places, um, uh, very rarely does a mold ever run in one machine and one machine only, um, maybe in medical environment. Most of us at some point are gonna be moving a mold from this machine to that machine. So I'm gonna call it machine A and machine B. So we're running parts here. These are the settings and it's a 150 ton machine. So something happens, maybe uh, we, the machine has a maintenance issue or we just need uh, to move it to a different machine. So the first thing we do is we look for another machine that's the same tonnage, um, maybe from the scheduling point of view. So and these machines look pretty much the same. It's just a different colors and um, they're 150 ton machines. So we're going to put it in there. All right. Um, and when we do that, um, we're going to, I'm taking you through a hypothetical scenario. So we move the mold over there, mold X, Y, Z, and we're going to, it's got 150 ton machine, so it has to be the same. So I'm going to do what I've done in the past. And um, so I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be the first one to admit that I've done things like this in the past. So I'm just going to copy those settings over. Um, just transfer those two settings over among all the others. Um, again, we're just focusing on the back pressure and hold pressure. So I'm going to copy 50 hydraulic for the back pressure and a thousand hydraulic for the hold pressure. Seems like that's the right thing to do. Okay. Um, and I've done this in the past. So it, this is good, right? So the slide says no. And to be more specific, this is good, right? Well, it could be, or it could not be. It's not as it's not that simple. So we're going to pretend that in this scenario that the answer is no. All right. So let's explain this a little bit further. So there's something that is called intensification ratio, and this is we're showing you on a hydraulic machine. So there's there's two there's a cylinder diameter. That's the there's a the diameter of the injection cylinder, that's the green cylinder. And if you look at the a cylinder from the back, it's just a circle. So we would be given the diameter of that, that injection cylinder, and we would calculate it into the areas. Basic area of a circle calculation, there's two ways to do it. You can use pi r squared, like they teach you in high school or middle school or college. Um, we teach it at, at 
what we think is a, a simpler way, and I don't have the, the formula to throw up on the screen, but the, the way we teach how to calculate the area of any circular shape would be the diameter times the diameter times 0 0.7854. 0 0.7854 is a constant value that works with any diameter of circle. It's actually the circumference divided by four, I believe, or maybe I'm wrong, pi divided by four, maybe that's it. Um, so we, we would do, use a diameter, calculate the area of the injection cylinder, and then we would calculate the area of the screw or the barrel. Um, they're practically the same. There's a few thousandths of an inch difference between the two. So we just call it one measurement. So we take the diameter of the screw and we do the same calculation and get the area. So now we have two areas. So it, what we're talking about is called intensification ratio. So intensification is a big word to say and it's easy to mess up. So we tend to abbreviate it R sub I. So R sub I means intensification ratio from this point forward. So the formula to calculate this would be, we would take the area of the cylinder, injection cylinder, and then we would divide it or compare it to the area of the screw. Um, mathematically, that compared to would be a division symbol. So that would be how, how mechanically, how a hydraulic machine gets the intensification ratio. If any of you are sitting right now and you have access to a, a pen or a pencil, take the, this, this will illustrate this point right here. So take the pen or pencil and use caution. So I want you to put the pointy part where the, where the lead or the, the ink, the, the, the writing end of the utensil, put it in the palm of your left hand and then put the eraser or the other, the bigger end of the pen in the, the palm of your right hand. So I'm holding it in front of my face and I'm just gonna apply a little bit of pressure. So I'm gonna give you a minute to notice what you're observing. So you can put that in the chat box if you want, but I'm gonna tell you what I'm observing. I'm observing that the writing end of the utensil, I feel more pressure than the, the eraser end or the, the larger end of the pencil. So that's exactly what's happening in your hydraulic molding machine. So looking at your, your screen here, the green, the injection cylinder is the eraser or the large end of your pen or pencil. And the screw tip, um, the screw area is the writing end of the utensil. So we're, I'm applying the same pressure, and hopefully you are too, and I feel more pressure on the smaller end. So that is uh, how hydraulic machines work. Uh, another analogy that get the point across, if, if you um, like are wearing a, a big work boot and you step on the floor, and you, if you were to like step on your hand and measure how, how it feels, how much pressure you feel, and then you were to put on like a high heel, and the same way to the, the same person and step on your hand, it would feel much more intense. It would be a lot more pressure. So um, the weight, um, so that the hydraulic pressure is constant and depending on the size of the screw tip, the, the, the pressure, the plastic pressure in the barrel is intensified or multiplied. Okay, and this happens. So some of you may be wondering, what if I have an electric machine? Um, it works totally different because there's no hydraulic injection cylinder. There's a, a servo motor with a belt drive or a, a screw drive. Um, but the, the pressure, the force is intensified to a pressure. We'll go get into more of that a little bit later. So there you go, there's the formula. Um, so a, another question that I get right now is, how do I know the area of the screw or the diameter of the screw to calculate the area? And how do I know the, how do I know how to get the area of the injection cylinder? So the first one, let's talk about the area of the screw. That should be relatively easy for anyone in a molding shop to find out. It may be the maintenance personnel. Um, it usually it's stamped on the barrel of somewhere on the injection unit of the molding machine. They'll have a little plaque and it'll say what the diameter of the screw and barrel is. Um, odds are you have a maintenance crib with a pair of parts, a spare check ring, a spare screw, and maybe an extra barrel or an old one. You should know or be able to find out without too much trouble, the size of the screw. 
because those are a wear item, they wear out, they need to be replaced. Now, the injection cylinder. To be totally honest, that can be very difficult to find. It might be in your molding machine manual or it might not. It's, I, don't, I can't explain to you why, but it's, that is difficult information to find. So the question now becomes, okay, Jason, you just told me how to calculate this ratio using the areas of these two cylinder, the cylinder and the screw, but you, now you just told me I can't find it. So there is another way to find it and it's act practical. It's the way that most of us do it. So what you can find in most of the machine manuals, there, there, there should be a spe specifications page. It's generally pretty easy to find in the manual of the machine. So it'll have things like max injection pressure, max injection speed, um, max recovery rate. Um, it have all the all the performance characteristics of the machine and somewhere else on the same page it'll it'll call it max system pressure or maximum hydraulic pressure they may call it line pressure so um like most of you know that are on here standard uh, uh, terminology is not very standard in our business so it'll be called system hydraulic line pressure or something to that effect so the other way to do it, and I don't have it on my PowerPoint. So the other way that you calculate intensification ratio is you you do, you take you find the max injection pressure for the screw that you're using in your machine, and you divide it by the maximum hydraulic pressure. So if you're looking at the specification page of a of a molding machine, it'll usually have three screw options. It's usually worded something like this: the A screw, the B screw, or the C screw. The A would be the smallest and the C would be the largest screw. So you do have to know what screw you have in there. And then you just find the screw like a 20, 25 or 28 millimeter screw. So you have the 25 millimeter and you go down and you find the max injection pressure. And then you go down somewhere else on the page and it'll tell you the hydraulic pressure of the machine. And you, you divide the hydraulic into the plastic pressure or the injection pressure. And it gives you the same ratio that, that you see here on the PowerPoint. And most of the time that's how we would find the intensification ratio if we don't already know it. A recommendation is that you label the machine somewhere near the controller what the intensification ratio is. After you go to the work to find it, you document it somehow. Okay, so let's go back and we saw a minute ago that, that just copying the hydraulic pressure most likely is not the right thing to do. It, it might, it could, we could get lucky to be right, but odds are it's going to be different. So here's what happens. Now we, we do some further investigation and we look in the manuals of both of these machines and we see that one's got a 20 millimeter screw diameter and the machine we're moving it to has a 23 millimeter screw diameter. So that right there presents some unique things to happen. So if we, if we did the calculation for the intensification ratios, for both of these machines. Now we're gonna find out that machine A had a ratio of 14.5 to one, and machine B had a ratio of 10 to one. So let me tell you what that means. So that machine, that means on machine A, for every one pound of hydraulic pressure, there would be 14.5 pounds of pressure in the barrel. And then in machine B, for every one pound of pressure, hydraulic pressure, there would only be 10 pounds of plastic pressure in, in the screw tip or in the, in the barrel. Okay. So now let's, let's see what happens when we copy those hydraulic pressures. Well, not copying those. So here's what was actually happening in machine A. So when we had the hydraulic, the back pressure set at 50 hydraulic, we multiply that times the ratio of 14 and a half. And that means the back pressure was actually 725 PSI specific. So that term specific, um, I'm, I have a slide in a few minutes that it visually shows you what that is, but what that what specific means, we have borrowed that term from a few of the molding machine OEMs. And that is a term to designate plastic pressure, but in the barrel. So that means if we were to measure the pressure in the nozzle somehow, that during recovery, that the pressure would be 725 PSI specific. And then the whole pressure set at a thousand. So we multiply that times the ratio and we get 14,500. 
I'm going to back up two slides and make sure I didn't miss something. I did. Okay, cool. So now, now we know that when we run at machine A, we know what was actually happening. So my question is, what do you think is more important to document the hydraulic values or the specific pressure values? Some of you may, may have heard that specific. This may be the first time that maybe, maybe you just call it 725 PSI plastic. And that's fine. Uh, we've kind of recently changed a little bit how we uh, teach this topic just for labeling purposes. Um, so over here in machine B, if we type in the same values hydraulically, so we just transfer the 50 back pressure and the 1000 hold pressure for hydraulic values. And if we multiply those by that machine's intensification ratio, now we see what's really happening in machine B. Now we're, we're not using 725 PSI specific back pressure, we're only getting 500. And we're only getting a hold pressure of 10,000 PSI specific. So my question is, is, is that gonna make the same part? Question could be, is it gonna make a good part? And the, the answer to both those questions is, well, is it gonna make the same part? The answer is no. So if you use that much less hold pressure and that much less back pressure, definitely the part's gonna be different. Now you might have to measure it to see that difference, but it's definitely different. The second question is, is it a good part or not? Now that, that's a more complicated. It could still be good or it could be bad. Um, the defects you might see would be possibly short shots, possibly sinks, voids. It could be just a, a undersized part of dimensional difference. So it, when we move the machine B, everything's gonna be smaller going towards being a short shot. Okay. Let's see. So how do we compensate for this? That's that's the question now. So yeah, I know I can't copy the, the hydraulic values over, so what do I do? So what we need to do is take this triangle right here. So when we move a mold from one machine to another, we need to duplicate, duplicate as best we can the pressure of the plastic, not the hydraulic. Because we saw on the previous slide that copying the hydraulic pressure from machine A to machine B, yeah, the hydraulic numbers are the same, but what's in the barrel, which is way more important, is different. So this little triangle up in the right-hand corner, um, we sneak this in RGG, we sneak this in. This is a real tricky way to teach, to show us how to do simple algebra. So um, this is one of the ways we use this triangle. So there's three three variables on that triangle. So in the top there's specific, it says spec, just to abbreviate it. So that's specific pressure. And just as a reminder, specific pressure is plastic pressure in the barrel. Uh, on the bottom left, we have hydraulic pressure. And in the bottom right, we have the intensification ratio. So if you know two of those values, you can always calculate the third. So the way I told you a minute ago to do, let's practice one way. First, the way I told you earlier to calculate the, the intensification ratio is, so if you take your thumb right now with me, so cover up RI with your thumb on the screen, and the, the equation to calculate what you're covering up is shown to you. So it, it would be specific divided by hydraulic. Okay, so that's how I told you a few minutes ago how we can calculate the intensification ratio. Okay, now what we're looking for right here in this scenario when we move the mold over, we're looking for the specific pressure. Or no, we're looking for the hydraulic pressure. I misspoke because we have on this on machine B, we, we're pretending we have to type in hydraulic value. So I'm going to take my thumb and cover up hydraulic. So the equation for that would be specific pressure divided by the intensification ratio. So that's a fairly simple calculation. So here it is. We're going to take the, the back pressure 725 specific and divide it by 10. And the answer would be what we set the hydraulic value for machine B. Same thing for the hold pressure. We, we take the 14,500 PSI specific 
and we divide it by the ratio of, of, of that machine, which is 10, and we get 1450 hydraulic. So on the surface, if you walk by and you see one machine set at 50, maybe the setup says 50 and 1,000, and when we throw it at machine B, we have 72 and a half and 1450. You're like, man, it's not set up the same. But is it? It, it is. So in the barrel, we're actually treating the plastic the same. Okay. So now we have two different set points. If we take both of those and multiply, multiply those hydraulic inputs by each machine's respective intensification ratio, what we get is we're actually treating the plastic the same. So now, regardless of the machine that the mold is in, we are treating the plastic the same. So on both scenarios with totally different set points, we have the back pressure of 725 and hold pressure of 1,000 or 14,500. And that is what we need to do. The plastic in the, in the barrel is at the same pressure. This is why we need to know the intensification ratio on our molding machines. It, we don't need to be going to the machine manual in the maintenance closet every time we need to calculate one of these values. So this, among other things, should be labeled on a laminated card somewhere near the controller. Okay, so right here we see the range of these two machines. The intensification ratio goes from 14 and a half to 10 to one. So Sorry about the dogs in the background. Um, so here's the thing, um, a long time ago, back in the 60s, maybe into the 70s, machines, some of the machines were intentionally made with an intensification ratio of 10. So the manufacturer would purposely size the screw to the cylinder size to make it a 10 to one ratio. That stop, stopped being true probably in the 70s. So if somebody tells you that you're, the intensification ratio of your molding machine is 10 to one, you should be very skeptical that maybe that's not correct. So it would have to be a fairly old, a very old machine for that to still be true. Um, it does make the math easy. So sometimes in training settings, we'll use 10 like we did on this one and it makes the math easier to do because I can do that without getting a calculator. But that, that doesn't mean it's true. Um, so the range of intensification ratios could be anywhere from I have a, a molding machine right now in my our, our training lab in Opelika, Alabama. It's at a college down there and the intensification ratio is 19 to 1. So for one pound of hydraulic pressure equals 19 specific pressure in the barrel. Um, I've seen other molding machines that with the intensification intensification ratio as low as eight or 8.2 to one, so much lower. Now there's a whole thing called low pressure molding, but that's, that's, that's a different ball game. So their, their ratios are like one or 1 1.5. If you have an electric machine, there is no hydraulics. What I mean by electric is fully electric servo motor. Uh, there is no hydraulics. So there's no hydraulic injection cylinder. So the pressure is all specific. So you you would type on type on the controller specific value. You you would just type in 725 for back pressure, and for hold you would type in 14,500. Um, it does the same similar thing, but through a totally different mechanism. So um, you're dealing just with plastic pressure values in the barrel or specific values. Another thing to keep in mind is that on most of the modern hydraulic machines you're able to change the input units. So it might be password protected, it might not be, it'll be on some back page sometimes. But even though it's a hydraulic machine, you can change it so that the numbers that you're inputting, back pressure and hold pressure in this case, you could go ahead and type in the specific values. It's still a hydraulic machine, but the machine does the math for you. And if you have newer hydraulic machines, that's probably the best way to do it, okay? So the goal is to treat the plastic the same, not the hydraulics the same. Um, we would like to mold this part exactly the same in machine A, machine B, machine C, you know, wherever it runs, we wanna have a 
a machine independent setup. So a setup that can travel with the mold wherever it goes, even if it goes to a different building or a different location. Um, not machine dependent setups. Okay, so now we have a third. So, so far we've talked about hydraulic pressure that would be in the injection cylinder. And then we talked about specific pressure, which is pressure of the plastic that in the barrel or in the nozzle. The next type of pressure would be cavity pressure. So cavity pressure is in the cavity or in the mold. Okay, so we set the back pressure at 72 and a half hydraulic and hold at 1450. But we see that the cavity pressure is not exactly where it should be. So where it should be. So what you're looking at here is a screenshot off of RGG's co-pilot system. So you see the dotted lines up top in, in the little call it window. That would be the template. So that's the cavity pressure when the part was good in machine A. So the first number that we got green numbers and blue numbers. So the first number 2027, 22.21 and 2658, those are what's happening right now this cycle. The numbers to the right that have in parentheses to have a T, that's the T stands for template. So the template is what the dotted lines are representing. That was the cavity pressure when it was in machine A. So that the scenario here is that the ideal part is the values in the template. So you might be wondering, well, we did the math and we're, we, we compensated for the difference in screw sizes, screw diameters, and the, the plastic pressure in the barrel is the same because we calculated it. So why? Um, let me stop right there and just say, not everyone has cavity pressure um, instrumentation, and that's fine. If you don't have cavity pressure um, instrumentation in your toolbox or in your list of things that you can look at, the best thing to do is what we just did up to this point. So you, you try to duplicate the, the specific pressure in the barrel. From So from this point forward, cavity pressure, it's either a tool you can use or the or it's something that you're aware of now. So maybe you're learning this for the first time right now and you, man, I don't have cavity pressure. This is useless. It's not. What's happening is useful to know that it happens. So sometimes even when we compensate for the hydraulic, we treat the plastic the same in the barrel. And then we see, well, even now the parts, the cavity pressure in the, in the mold is slightly different. And the question is, the template says 3,500, te technically the third, is 3406 and 3366. Um, but why? So the cavity pressure should be at 3500, but it's not. And the, the question is why? Um, so this is this is the, the reason why we have process technicians. This is the reason why we have process engineers. This is the reason we can't set the exact same values on a molding machine and those input values always make the same part. Now, so anytime that someone, can, you've been running a part good for three weeks, four weeks, three months, for a long time, and all of a sudden there's a defect happening. And the defect could be, the, you know, a dirty mold or a, a piece of equipment failure, but let's just pretend that, you know, the mold's not dirty, uh, the equipment's working fine, the materials and, you know, it's dry and all that stuff, but still we have a defect. So when we have a defect, that usually goes back to the cavity pressure being different, like we see in this template, in this screenshot here. So we we go fix the, the defect, whatever it is. We If it's a short, we raise some pressure, hold pressure all over the transfer to, to, to get rid of the defect, or the opposite, if it's flash or oversized, we might lower hold pressure. Um, what we're doing is we're putting the cavity pressure back to where it's supposed to be. Now the, the thought that the question is, is but my my pressure in the barrel is 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 correct. Why is it translating to a different result in the cavity? Um, here's why. We have things called static pressure losses. So here's a little drawing of on the far right, we have the injection cylinder with the purple hydraulic fluid, then we have the hopper and we have the screw. And going down, we have the screw tip. So in this picture, the screw looks like it's sitting at bottom and visually it is, but let's just pretend it's backed up a little bit and we have some 
a cushion there and we have that whole pressure that we calculated 14,500 in the barrel um, and we know that we can we can look on the machine and see what pressure it's given us but then beyond that to the left we have the sprue then the runner and then this little rectangular part with a green dot and a blue dot so let me back up see the green the green numbers and the the blue numbers with the green line and blue line, those are representing cavity pressure sensors in these locations. So we color code our, our curves just to make things standard. You don't have to, but the green sensor is what we call a post gate sensor. And the blue one would be end of cavity or end of fill sensor. So you see that the end of fill is way down there where it's gonna short shot and the, the green, the post gate is closer to the gate. So plastic is very, very, very compressible. It's like a big sponge. Um, it's basically, if you read point number one, it's compressible half to three quarters of a percent for every 1,000 PSI of pressure, okay? Um, and it doesn't transmit pressure very, very well. So we call this a static pressure loss. So after the mold is full, this runner is full, the sprue is full, the, the cavity is full, and we have pressure on both of those sensors there. And if we were to back up into the barrel and look, we would have the 14,500. And if you look back at this page, with 14,500 in the barrel, we're only getting around 2,500 to 3,000 inside the cavity. That's evidence right there of the static pressure losses and how compressible plastic is. So the further we get away from the, the nozzle or the barrel, the low, that pressure just goes downhill. It's a big pressure gradient. Um, if we have 14.5 in the barrel, we might have 12,000 in the runner, in the sprue. Maybe halfway down the runner, we might have you know 7,000. On the other side of the gate, we have about 3,000 or 20, 2,500 or whatever. And then as we go down towards the end of cavity where the blue sensor is, you know, we have even less. So that that's that's in, in in the viscosity of the plastic changes day to day, shot to shot. So even when the machine is doing exactly what we told it to, we can have some variation downstream into the parts. Okay. Um, so we have twelve thousand there. Sorry, I didn't know I had numbers up there. So with the fourteen five in the barrel, we're getting twelve thousand at the gate and three thousand at the end of cavity. Now I want to point out that these numbers that I'm throwing out at you, the 12,000 and 3,000, don't take it to think that parts have to have those numbers to be good parts. Some parts may be good at these values, but every part has their own unique pressure criteria that makes the part good. But the dimensions and the quality of the part are directly, directly related to whatever pressure um, is in that part. So basically you make a good part, and then you read the, the pressures in the cavity and that becomes your gold standard. That's what you need to duplicate all the time. So with the, at the couple two process, so that's RGG teaches two types of processing techniques. One is the couple two, the other is the couple three. So if these are new terms to you, the couple two is probably what most of you do, even if you don't call it that. Um, that means we're going to fill the mold about 99% full. Usually there's a, a small sort shot before we go into the hold phase, the pack and hold phase. Um, so it's a two-stage process. We have the filling phase, and then we hit transfer position, and then we go to the second stage, pressurization. Um, that second stage can be called pack. It could, I'm talking about what the machine calls it. It could be called pack. It could be called hold. There could be one of each. Um, there's, there's many different names. Typically, I just call it pack and hold pressure. I lump them together, or I call it second stage pressure. So at the coupled two, the pivot point or the control point is in the molding machine, in the barrel. So that would be right at transfer. After transfer, we know what the hold pressure is. So in this case, we've been talking about it's 14,500. Anything that happens after that to the left on your screen, it's at the mercy of how viscous the plastic is that particular shot. So it's like a seesaw. If the viscosity is higher, that 14,500 pressure will put less pressure at the end of the cavity. If the viscosity dips on the low side, 
that that exact same hold pressure will put in more pressure at the end of the cavity. So there's no compensation after we go to hold pressure. The best machine in the world doesn't compensate hold pressure for how how viscous or how how thick the material might be. It compensates for the filling phase really well. So this is decoupled two, and this is a fine molding technique, but there's one that's even better. So if you're doing decoupled two, and the amount of variation you see in your parts is acceptable, the scrap weight, the scrap rate is acceptable, then that's what you do. But there are cases where you can do do the right things, and even with that, the variation is more than your part tolerances can accommodate, or you just have maybe you have wide spec material or recycled material. So you're dealing not maybe not with tight specifications on your part, but you're dealing with massive material viscosity changes. So this technique might not be good enough. Good enough. So the next thing we would do is we would move that control point from the machine and move it into the mold. And you see the name changed a little bit. It went, whoops, sorry. It went from decoupled two to decoupled three. So decoupled three, let me give you a short quick explanation of that right now and then obviously more questions can be get thrown at me later so the couple three we're doing three to three distinct phases we have a fill fill stage pack stage and a hold phase three separate documented processes uh stages and the main thing is we are packing using the machine to pack to a very specific pressure inside the cavity near the gate so now we know what the pressure is in the barrel we know what the pressure is in the cavity. So now whatever viscosity variation we have only goes through that steady pressure loss from one from the one sensor to the other. Imagine closed loop molding or closed loop. Uh, so we have feedback from the, from the mold controlling the pack phase of the machine. So that minimizes whatever variation you have or whatever material characteristics, it narrows all that variation down. A uh, very good high precise molding technique. Um, there's a video right here that shows you a little bit about it. In mold cavity pressure sensors, gather information needed to assure quality on every shot. Sen oh, sorry. Start that over, sorry. In mold cavity pressure sensors, gather information needed to assure quality on every shot. Sensors can be placed directly in the cavity or behind transfer pens like shown here. When plastic is injected into the mold, the sensor sends pressure data to a process control system such as the Copilot. The Copilot then tells you whether or not the product is to spec. If the shot does not stay within set boundaries, it is automatically sorted out. For more information, please visit rjginc.com. So that's a short little promotional video we do. There we go. Um, all right, so we have two types of sensors, two locations we put sensors in our molds. We put some near the near the near the gate. Those are called be called a post gate sensor, and those will be used for controlling the process. The, the, the decouple three that I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, process control. We would pack to that pressure on the post gate sensor, and then the end of cavity, the blue one, would be the best place to monitor overall quality of your parts. So the most variation that your parts are. are that your parts have are going to be seen at the end of the cavity. So overall dimensional variation is best monitored there. Um, another, the most common use for that center, sensor is to detect short shots. So an extreme uh, variation of the process can result in flash or short shots. So if there's a short shot, that blue sensor is going to read zero pressure. So it's a fairly easy thing to detect short shots. And you know, short shots are usually at the top of most companies' defect list. It's either short shots or flash or both. Not everyone has that, but that's probably the most common if you survey everybody. Um, so this is a recap. So this puts all the different pressures all in one picture. So on the far right, we have hydraulic pressure. 
units can be PSR or they can be like your fuses, they can be bar, it doesn't matter. It, it's pressure of the hydraulic fluid. That's the, the most useful pressure that we deal with. Um, it means the least because it's not even touching the plastic. So it's only in the hydraulic system. So the next one in the middle will be specific pressure. So the best thing, you, the next best thing you can do is use the intensification ratio to at least get the same specific pressure in the barrel. You treat the plastic the same in the in the barrel from run to run or machine move to machine move. Um, and a lot of times that's good enough, but because of the static pressure losses, the result in the cavity is not always the same. So cavity pressure is the most important pressure because if you want to make the same part every time, you got to duplicate the cavity pressure every time. Um, now, let me re say, say this again. Sometimes duplicating the specific pressure, well, it, it'll result in repeatable cavity pressures, but not always. So there are times where you need to go that extra step and use what we call a decouple three process or pit sensors in the mold just to monitor the quality. So I think that's the last slide. So we have hydraulic specific and cavity, cavity being the most important, specific being the next most important, hydraulic being just a tool we use to make, <laughs> to get everything else done. Um, from machine to machine, hydraulic settings will, will be different, no doubt. Um, the other two specific and cavity pressure should probably be the same, no matter where the mold is at. Um, you see on the cavity pressure that picture of the little graphical data uh, right next to the mold, that's, that's what we call a cycle graph. And the system traces those curves live as they happen. And you can compare it to a template. Uh, you can set alarm values around things like peak pressure or cooling rate or pack rate. And if it varies from what you know is good, we can send a 10 volt signal and reject that part. So we send the 10 volt signal to whatever your sorting device is. It can be a little part flipper like we showed in that video. It could be a reversing conveyor. It could be a, a robot. So we could actually grab the parts and dump them in the grinder or to the reject bin. Sometimes it's nothing more than a light tree, you know, red, red and green, good and bad, and the red light will come on when it's a bad part. So there's a, a lots of things you can do with this. Um, the other question that some of you might be having is, can, can any machine receive cavity pressure sensors or can any machine use the co-pilot system? And the answer is yes. Um, any every machine ever made might be a stretch but every machine that we've ever dealt with uh, you can put a copilot system on there you can interface with it every now and then depending on the oem or the age of the machine you might have to get some um, some of the signals um, available from the machine manufacturer and they all work with us on that and they can make those available um, but most machines though you can just you grab those signals the way the machine came. Um, as far as putting the sensors in the mold, the transducers, uh, that can be done on a brand new mold, um, which is the easiest just because you're building the mold and also the cost. It's, it's not a big cost when it compared to the cost of the whole mold build, but it's not a big deal to put them in existing molds either. So if, if you have a problematic mold and you're like, man, I wish I would have done that when it was new, you can still do it on, on an old existing mold. So the video showed sensors that sit underneath ejector pins. Um, you can also put sensors under static pins, so that'd be a pin on the stationary side or on a slide. Um, you can also put what's called flush mount sensors, so the sensor actually goes into the cavity and the plastic literally touches the sensor head itself. Um, and it just leaves a little witness mark on the, on the part, just like a small ejector pin would. So um, lots of applications for this stuff. Um, I was a customer using these things and doing what I've been telling you about for 17 years. So um, I was using this before I worked here. So I truly believe in it. And I think that's all I have to present. Um, that's all I have right now. All right, thank you, Jason, for the presentation. Uh, we can now move to questions uh, from the attendees. So attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the question tab or in the chat tab on that GoToWebinar pop-up. Uh, we did get uh, one question. So uh, what is the typical range of intensification ratios? So it goes anywhere from the highest I've 
actually worked with is about 19 to 1. So that machine has around 40,000 PSI of injection pressure. Um, typical hydraulic system is around 2,000 PSI. So um, you multiply that times 19, you're up around 40 grand. Um, so 19 to 20 on the high end and around 8, 8 to 1 or 7 to 1 at the low end. All right. And uh, just because this is a, such a technical topic, does RJG offer any more formal training on this kind of stuff? Yeah. So we have a range of classes. So we, you know, and everyone could be at different paths in their learning journey. So, uh, so we have introductory classes. We have a few that are online, self-paced. We have some, you know, shorter entry level positions for someone new to molding or someone who maybe works at your company, but doesn't work on the machines. Um, it's more about terminology and what things are called. And then we have like three day workshops where you're really doing a lot of hands on stuff like pushing buttons and making parts. And then we have, you know, some specialty courses like mold design, part design, uh, graph interpretation. And then, uh, you know, what we're known for, the, 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 I guess the top, the cream of the crop would be our master molder program. So master molder, there's a master molder one and master molder two. So each of those are two weeks long. And they're the only classes that we that we do that are pass fail. So we hold those to a very high standard. When you get done with those with the passing grade, you really have something you should be proud of. All right. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I didn't see any other questions come through. So, Jason, I want to thank you as well as the rest as well as the rest of RJG uh, for offering the information today. Just a reminder to everyone, the recording will be posted by the end of the week. Thank you to all of the attendees for being here. And I will now say something. Can I add one thing before you, you close out? Absolutely. So uh, we I have a YouTube channel, RJG does, but I do the videos. So if you like what you saw or you want to learn more, go to go to YouTube, RJG Inc. and subscribe to that. And we have different uh, different categories, but there's one called technician tips and tricks. And I do little videos on every all these little useful things that you can show new people or just refresh like how to change the nozzle tip. I, had, I did a video on this topic specifically, so there's lots of cool stuff there. All right, thanks, Jason. I'll send a link to that YouTube channel uh, along with the uh, recording uh, when that's posted, so everyone keep a lookout for that. Again, Jason, thank you very much for your time and effort here, uh, and I will now end the webinar. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.